Hi Oli, so you've been chair of the ERAS Society ever since its inception. This is now its seventh World Congress, so you must be quite excited about that. And what are you expecting to cover and to see this week? Well, it's really exciting to be yeah. here in Liverpool and to host uh, with the ERAS UK, the seventh World Congress. We, uh, we have a lot of specialties that are present here today, which is really exciting. We're broadening up. We're seeing how ERAS is spreading to every type of major surgery. So we have decision makers from different parts of the world who are running big healthcare systems or hospitals, hospital groups, coming together to work with the clinicians to make it possible to, to move this in that community as well and make yeah. people understand how good it is. Yeah. Yeah. So we're trying to see what we can do from the society's point of view for people that really are not having very good care at all. For sure, yeah. Fascinating. So Oli, um, we've recently implemented a recovery program for cardiac surgery patients yeah. in James Cook in Middlesbrough in the UK and that was quite difficult logistically to implement and I've been quite impressed by how the birth of the ERAS Society went from a few, presumably a few surgeons chatting over coffee yeah. to this kind of global brand of the ERAS Society. How did you manage to kind of facilitate that development? Well, it's about working with the right people mm. to begin with. I think that that's really been the key. Uh, we've been able to uh, have people approach us and want to join and work in this yeah. new way and finding that it's rewarding to have anesthesiologists, intensivists, surgeons, nurses, yeah. everybody come together and seeing the entire mm. journey and really moving from that platform. And I think that's what we're providing. We're providing that meeting point mm. for everybody to come together and then they can bring it to their specialty meetings as well. I think mm. that's been the key to the success really. We're, we, we filled a gap that was waiting for us yeah. to be filled. Tim, well, uh, you were instrumental in, in really the, the driver of the guidelines for lung surgery. And uh, I was happy to help out a little bit to the side there. Yep. Tell me, how did you feel about that work? And what does that mean for lung surgery today, do you think? It was tough and we were trying to fill a, a vacuum. There were no um, guidelines as such. There was a lot of interest in what people were calling fast track surgery at the, at the time. We were approached because we'd got experience. We are the first people really to promote ERAS and thoracic surgery. And so the ERAS Society approached me and I um, then got together a group of people who I thought would be important, not just in writing the guidelines, but also in helping to promote them as well. I think, as you say, you, you, ha you have enthusiasts approach you, and that's, that's what came about as well. So we were able to identify a group of surgeons and anesthesiologists initially who either had expertise in, in fast track or enhanced recovery or had expertise in particular components like chest drain management. And then on top of that, we had people coming to us and saying, look, we'd really like to be involved. And we we're very lucky in, in, in that respect that we had some great people from Lausanne and the States. So once we've got the working group together. We divided each component amongst ourselves, so there were two authors for each for each section, and the sections were really determined by looking at the colorectal guidelines, and so using a lot of the work that had been done already and the structures. Yeah, uh, because many of the treatments are really just to reduce stress, so it works in many different surgeries. That, that's yeah, exa right? exactly right, and I'm looking at the guidelines now and you're actually seeing how many of the components are generic and common to every specialty and how many are specific to thoracic surgery. And it's probably about a two-thirds, one-third split. So there's only yeah. one-third is actually specific to thoracic surgery. But that's still very important, isn't it? For sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so once we got everyone together and we'd agreed who's going to do what, then everyone wrote their sections and it all came back. And if you remember, oh, yes. you uh, <laughs> met with the other three yeah. members of the, the core groups, so me, Neil Rasburn and Babu Naidu. And then we went through a fairly rigorous process of determining the level of evidence and then the recommendations. And then that went out again to the group. And then it came out. So it was a, a, a lot of touring and throwing. And in the end, it was a, a long process, I think. Yeah. It was probably about three years from its mm. inception to actual publication of the guidelines. 
but now they've been published. So um, we've already had the first national conference in Thoracic ERS, and that was in Poland about six weeks ago. And we've got another one coming up in South America, in Chile, in a few months' time. So those are just dedicated Thoracic ERS conferences. And then within the major global cardiothoracic meetings, there is always a section on ERAS now. So Great. yeah, very topical, very timely. Tim, <laughs> tell me about, you had the guidelines in existence. How did you then translate the guidelines on paper to implementing yeah. them in the real world in well, your thoracic? Well, I think unit? we didn't actually. I think that was the, the point. So when we first um, uh, came up, as you did in, mm. in, in, yeah, in yeah, Middlesbrough a couple of years ago, you wanted to implement ERAS in your cardiac unit is 2010 when, when, when we implemented oh. ERAS in, in our unit and that was on the back of a national initiative within the NHS mm. for a colorectal orthopedics gyne and neurology yeah, yeah, right. yeah so those are the four specialties identified and we, th we thought well hold on a moment surely we can do something as yeah. well so our, our steps were firstly to look at the guidelines which existed in other specialties yeah and then to use those parts of those programs which we thought were important and we could mirror in thoracic surgery and then to parachute in thoracic specific yeah. components. We were lucky in our hospital, I think there was a perfect storm in that we had a group of young surgeons, a group of young keen anaesthetists. Yeah. The uh, hospital itself was keen on implementing day of surgery admission and to have day of surgery admission you have to have a sophisticated pre-op assessment unit. So we just piggybacked in on the pre-op admission and day of surgery, and that's how we started actually. Once that's going, we, and we've used that as our bedrock for, the, for everything else that's happened. So patients are educated and are optimized and admitted on the day of surgery. So there was people who objected, for sure, as you have found. Yeah. But actually, one of the key objectors was an anaesthetist who right at the beginning said, I'm not having this. I'm not having my patients being assessed by another anaesthetist and me not meeting them the, the day before. Yeah. And then we went through the whole process and he saw how good it was and he had the humility to be able to stand up at the end of it all and say, can I just say this is the single best thing that has affected my daily practice. It's about being a team, getting rid of the hierarchies, having the infrastructures in place and for us we started with the pre-op unit and then giving that feedback to everyone that's, that's involved. Yeah. yeah. So data collection has been a key part of that as well. Yeah. Uh, Jim, last couple of years you've been implementing ERAS protocols in mm. cardiac, so cardiac is relatively new to the game. Mm, indeed. We face challenges, you face challenges as, as well. Were they fairly similar to yeah. ours and how did you overcome them? So I think my experience almost directly mirrors your experience. There were no guidelines in existence when we started. We translated guidelines from colorectal surgery and all the other subspecialties and translated them to cardiac surgery. So we had a kind of a good idea of what protocol was safe, what we could deliver and how feasible it was to deliver that protocol. One of the challenges which you alluded to was changing behavior. Mm. And I think certainly in cardi cardiac surgery, the surgery and the anesthesia has been delivered in quite a well-preserved manner or recipe, as you might say, over the last 5, 10, 15 years. So there was initially quite a lot of resistance to changing the way we do things. And luckily there was some pressure, as you alluded to, from NHS to try and move things forward. And we had the results which are published widespread from your work, Ollie, and the JAMA article. Mm -hmm. So I took that. I actually took that article to my cardiac surgeons and cardiac anaesthetists and said, these are the potential benefits. The protocol appears on the surface to be relatively safe. Mm. Let's give it a go. And, you know, you, you do get the odd person who's a dissenter or, a, yeah. you know, doesn't want to change their behavior because it's the way they've done it for 10 years. But actually, as you say, they see good examples of patients recovering quickly and then they quickly realized the potential benefits and then they came on board quite quickly in the piece and now yeah. it's kind of embraced by all. So the whole unit is now yeah. involved yeah. and every patient is part of yeah. that. High risk patients, low risk patients, our ethos is that whatever benefits that can be gained from an ERAS protocol, a bundle, who's to say that the high risk patient won't benefit more from early extubation, early mobilization, yeah and the frailer, sicker patients, I personally think, will benefit more from 
ERAS than yeah. the younger patients who are generally fitter. Yeah. I agree with that and I, I don't know what you think Ollie but I see when people say oh, we're going to identify the patients for the ERAS pathway and it's like it's, no you, you, you can't do that because the, the principles apply to every single patient that comes Absolutely. into the hospital. Don't Absolutely. You know? We yeah. had a lot of resistance early on yeah. to, especially with the high risk patients people were mm. saying no no you can't do it on this patient because yeah. it's too high risk yeah. and those are the ones that benefit the most, benefit the most don't they? because really down the line it's about reducing the stress. Yeah. And then, of course, these vulnerable organs are doing much better. Yeah. So, have you found that people have been hesitant <coughs> about embracing the concept of ERAS? And if so, why do you think that's been? Well, first of all, we're a very traditional group of professionals. We don't like to change. Doctors in general, I think, uh, and the way we've been taught, that's how we continue to practice. And partly because we feel safe with the methodology that we're using. So in a way, I can understand it. But the problem is we're too slow to yep. make changes. I mean, it takes easily 15 years for something that has been proven to be a benefit to actually get into what we would say standard of care. The only way to make people see what they're actually doing is to help them measure the details of what they are actually doing in their daily practice. And that's how we built our implementation program from the society, is just to show people this is actually what's going on. You, you know, you're missing out on these things in your practice and we can help you to change that. And uh, we have uh, initiated an implementation program where we use methodology from the professionals, you know, like the standard PDSA cycles, plan, do, study, act, where you just show people what they're doing set up a method to you know, decide what to do about it, mm -hmm. get it in motion and then look at the results and then start over again. So yeah. with the team, with everybody involved, so all the people that need to be involved. So I think that really helps people to, to move ahead much faster and that helps them overcome these uh, barriers that yeah. they're seeing. And then once you've implemented, then data is the key. You have it? to keep, that's got to yeah. be a routine. You, yeah. you have to keep everybody involved and in knowing what their specific role in the bigger picture is and what that does for outcomes in yeah. the end. And yeah. you can make that very clear by yeah. just putting that data together. For sure, yeah. So, well, one of the things that I know is, is of interest, uh, particular interest in, in, in lung surgery and I think also in cardiac surgery is, is the use of specific drains. Now that's something that I don't know all that much about, so maybe you can tell me a little bit more. We know about drains, of course, yeah, Ollie, because drains, uh, you have some special but, drains. Uh, in colorectal surgery, of course, you, you used to have drains and now you're, yeah, we're, you're, we're, you're, we're, you've pulled back from, exactly. from, from that. And we know in thoracic surgery and, 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 and cardiac surgery as well, Drains are required, yeah. and, uh, but they can be an issue uh, in, in themselves. Drains are, uh, serve a slightly different role in lung surgery than they do in, in other specialties because they're not, they're not just to drain blood or fluid, pleural fluid, but they're there to drain air as well because the lung is an organ which yeah. is a bag of air and if you operate on it then it can it can leak air afterwards. And actually an air leak is one of the most important post complications. That makes sense even to a colorectal system. I used <laughs> yes. to do, used yeah. to do trauma. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so that's when... So you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so a, a chest drain is normally required. So for very minor thoracic procedures then maybe we wouldn't put a chest drain in. But the old-fashioned dogma of chest drain drain management is that after a lung cancer resection you have two big drains in one at the apex to drain air and one at the base to drain blood or, or pleural fluid. Now drains are as big as your finger and you can imagine something as big as your finger poking between your ribs that's quite it's something which is quite sore so not only is it painful one of the main sources of post-operative pain it's something else which is going to tie the, 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 the patient to, to, to the bed. So there's been work looking at how many drains do you need and you actually only need one drain after a lung operation. So straight away that makes a, a, a difference to the speed a, a patient can recover, their pain and also their respiratory function as well. And then people have begun to talk a lot about other ways of managing chest drains. So traditionally mm -hmm. all drains would be placed on suction to try and encourage the lung to re-expand or whatever and you know, it's all the reasons for this are lost in the, the realm of the history of thoracic surgery but actually um, suction and the continuous application of suction doesn't appear to be beneficial to patients. 
So we would recommend not uh, applying routine suction. Then we look at the volumes of the amount of fluid coming out. And when I trained, you know, a drain had to stay in until there was less than 200 mils mm. per day of pleural fluid coming out. And then gradually as people have become more confident, that threshold has gone up and up and up. And now we find people just don't care. It doesn't matter. Your body will actually re reabsorb that, that fluid. The pleural mm. membrane is a very efficient absorber of fluid. So anyway, in the guidelines, we've recommended an upper, a threshold of 450 mils for 24 hours, and that seems to keep everyone happy and is based on evidence. So that's why drains are so important from thoracic surgery and mm. cardiac surgery. I don't think you do a cardiac operation without putting a drain in at yeah. the end, would you? Yeah, so cardiac yeah. surgery, I'm sure you're aware, um, is slightly unique in that the majority of our patients are put on cardiopulmonary bypass with the inherent use of high dose anticoagulation. Um, plus you've got the added physiological hemostatic compromise which occurs as you run the patient's blood yeah. through a bypass machine with all the foreign elements and the plastics and there is definitely a coagulopathy associated with the use of bypass. So there is a particular issue of bleeding, anticoagulation, coagulopathy in cardiac surgery. So there's, there's always a concern about drains and taking them out early versus late and it's obviously a balancing act of safety for each individualized patient but as you say one of the tenets of the ERAS protocol is liberation of the patient from mm. the bed from the drain to facilitate mobilization to decrease pain decrease opiate requirement so you do have to get the drains out in a timely safe fashion and I think the digital drains that we see in these days can help your nursing staff accurately measure drain outputs and then once your criteria for drain removal is met it can be removed and I think that's one of the main advantages of having a digital drain which yep. shows you exactly with a high level of accuracy how much yep. drain fluid blood you're losing on an hourly basis yeah, yeah. and you can then build that safety criteria into your ERAS protocol and switch to a nurse-led drain removal protocol, protocol as opposed yep. to waiting for the surgeon to turn up on his morning ward round and saying, is it okay to remove this drain? Because yeah. that inevitably leads to delays. Yeah. And obviously the ethos of ERAS is to get patients going quickly. So that's interesting. So for you, the benefits of a digital drainage system are having an algorithm or protocol driven algorithm for removal of chest drains. Yeah. So you're not reliant on a single individual coming. Yeah. And that's, I think in thoracic surgery, there are various advantages to digital drainage system but I think that's the most important mm. one. If you have a protocol in which you have defined what the safe uh, pleural fluid output is mm. and then when it's safe to remove a drain depending on when, when the air leak stopped you've got a device a digital drainage system which will give you both those answers yeah. then you don't need to wait for an individual to come around yeah. and tell you when to, to take it out. And in the, the literature, that appears to be the main advantage in thoracic surgery is that you've removed that uh, variability between observers in when a, a drain can be removed. Whereas in the past, when we've been using non-digital drainage systems, there's been a bit of artistry, a bit of witchcraft, yeah. a bit of yeah, um, personal indeed. preference of, as, to, as to when it comes out. There are other purported advantages to, to digital chest drains in that for thoracic surgery, they're very portable. Yeah. Um, if you do need suction, then you can apply suction without having to have the chest drain attached to the wall, yeah. so the patient is more mobile. And for the nurses, it's much nicer because it's a closed unit, so if you inadvertently kick the bottle over, you're not <laughs> going to make a mess yeah. all over the place. So yes, it sits very nicely within the whole um, uh, philosophy of, uh, of enhanced recovery. Which I think brings us on to the, our closing question to you, Ollie. Ian. Okay. What do you see for the future of ERAS as... ERAS president, what's the future hold for us all? Yeah, well, I, I hope we can build on the groups that we've initiated and, and the platform uh, platforms, I would say, first of all, the meeting places for all the different specialties to come together. And then with the guidelines as a starting point with some of the best expertise in the world for thoracic surgery uh, with Tim and, and the group, uh, I think there's a really fantastic future just waiting and for cardiac it's coming also we have the cardiac group here and so that's what we're hoping to be able to help provide yeah brilliant well thanks thank you, well, thank you. Nice it's to, interesting uh, to learn yeah nice to speak to you yeah. it's been a pleasure cheers okay